Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Church this morning. It's lovely to have all of you here. Uh, as we get started today, just a few brief announcements. A reminder, uh, you'll see it in the bulletin, printed or emailed, that we do have a congregational meeting coming up April 18th in the evening. If everyone could set that time aside, we would really love to have you here. Uh, also, just a comment that uh, Good Friday service is coming up as well, so we will have a Good Friday service. And just throwing an idea out there as council, we've been talking about some ideas to uh, get the congregation together in uh, social ways. So we're tossing some ideas back and forth, um, like a chili cook-off, so dust off your recipes if you have any. But if anyone else has ideas as well, love to hear them. Bring your ideas forward and uh, we can get that set up. That's all we have for announcements this morning. So as we begin the service, why don't we all stand and greet each other this morning? And good morning. It's good to be together in the presence of the Lord on this Palm Sunday on a beautiful sunny morning. Please join me in a call to worship from Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors. Who is this King of glory? Grace be with you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's join together in song.
may be seated. From the Psalms we hear these words. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled. Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why is it, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back. O mountains, that you skip like rams. O hills, like lambs. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turns the rock into a pool of water and the flint into a spring of water. Let us pray. And gracious God, creator of heaven and earth, almighty um, and majestic one, we hear that the creation itself responds at your presence, that the hills skip, that the mountains leap, that the rivers turn back. And yet we, too often we confess, ignore your presence, overlook it, and wander in our own ways. Forgive us, we pray. Give us hearts that are receptive to your presence, to the good news that you give us in Jesus, so that your word might be to us like water from, uh, come from the rock, the spring of water from the very flints, and that we might receive your salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. And then we hear these words from Zechariah the prophet. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion, Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. In response to the promise of God's salvation, we uh, respond with our offerings this morning for the Combined Refugee Committee of the Christian Reformed Churches in Chatham. And then looking ahead on Good Friday, on Friday our offering will be for Hope Haven and on Easter Sunday for the Center for Public Dialogue.
So we have the opportunity to share items of information, of thanksgiving, or of a concern. And so if you have a prayer request or something you want to share at this time, go to it. There we go. Uh, a while back, I asked for a prayer request for our daughter Stacy's her father-in-law. Uh, he had been quite ill and hospitalized. Uh, he did pass away peacefully in his sleep last week. So just to pray for that family. So we pray for Stacy's family as they uh, grieve her father-in-law's passing. Um, just pray for Julie as she recovers from surgery this week. Uh, she's having a hard time with it, but just pray that the next couple of weeks will go good for her. Um, and also, uh, on a note of passing away, just pray for my uh, brother and his wife, Jan Andrew and Janet, as Janet's mother passed away last night, too. So, so your br oh, okay. So, Janet's, oh, your mother. Your sister in law, Janet's mother, passed away. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And Tina, when is your procedure? When is your surgery? April 4? Okay. Let us pray. Gracious God and Father, as your people we gather once again grateful for the opportunity of being together, being in your presence, thankful for the invitation that you give for us to come together to sing your praises, to bring honor, glory, and praise to you, creator of heaven and earth, the one who redeems us and who restores all things in Jesus Christ. And so we pray that you would help us to be able to celebrate um, you know, his coming, that on this Palm Sunday as we remember Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and we remember how the crowds, how the people around him took up the shout, Hosanna, we pray that you would help us to sing praises to you, to bring glory, honor, and thanksgiving to you for the goodness that you've given us in Jesus, for the way Jesus uh, came to proclaim your coming, and that in, in him, through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, you have opened up the way for life for us as your people. And so we ask, Lord, that as your people, you would help us to encourage and bless each other. That you would encourage us that, so that we might continue to follow along in Jesus' footsteps. That we might continue to put our hand to the plow and look forward to the ways that you have uh, open to us the ways that we might serve and honor and bless you. That as your people gathered here, you would help us to follow in that way, to be able then to bear witness to, the, to, the, uh, to, to your life in our community, in our congregation, in our families, in our communities, and in the world. So Lord, we bring the needs of this world to you, in a world that is full of strife and conflict, full of hostility and abuse, full of sorrow and despair. We ask, Lord, that wherever your people are gathered, we may be a light, a light that points to your desires, and that you would help us to work in ways that uh, use the resources that you've given in order to bring hope to those who are downtrodden, food to those who are hungry, clothing to those who need it, shelter to those who have been displaced, peace in those places where there's conflict. We ask, Lord, for your blessing. We pray, Father, for wisdom for um, um, leaders in this world and for voters who, who elect those leaders. And we ask that you would give us wisdom and compassion uh, that we might seek uh, leaders that, that uh, honor you and that look for, uh, for peace and for justice in this world. We ask, Lord, for your beginning, your blessings. We pray for uh, Stacy and her family as they mourn her father-in-law's passing. We thank you that that passing has, was, was peaceful 
And we ask, Lord, that that might be a comfort to them and that they would be able to comfort each other and, and bless and encourage one another. We pray also for Janet's family as they mourn the death of her mother. And we ask for comfort for them as well that we know, Father, that you are, are, are the source of all comfort and consolation. And we ask that you would help us to receive that in ways that we are able to share it with others so that they might know the consolation that comes to you through Jesus. We pray for Julie as she recovers from surgery, and we ask, and thank you that she was able to get that. We pray that, that as you know, um, uh, she recovers, her, she, her voice would come back, and that she would just feel better and be able to deal with the medications that she's treat, receiving as she recovers. We ask for your blessing upon her. We pray for uh, Tina, for Ian, Ian's partner, who also is recovering from surgery. And we ask that that might go smoothly for her, that she would be able to return home s quickly. And we, we ask for, for your healing for, her, for Tina. We pray for Tina, who's with us here, as she waits uh, for surgery in, in early April. And we ask that you would give her patience and that there would be nothing that would get in the way of that and that uh, that surgery would happen uh, a as planned. We pray, Lord, for all of us. You know, Lord, all of our needs, our sorrows, our concerns, as well as our joys. We ask that you would help us to recognize the joy that comes from you. And then in times of sorrow and grief, be able to turn to you, knowing that you know what we need better than we, ask, than we do ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing Hosanna. Those who are going to Sunday school may do so now. So we read this morning from Luke chapter 19, which is the end of the chapter that was read Sunday, our last week, uh, the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. Uh, and, and, and as the way this unfolds, Jesus approaches Jerusalem and uh, three weeks ago, or two weeks ago, we, was the story of the healing of the blind man uh, near Jericho. Then Jesus passes through Jericho, and that's where he encounters Zacchaeus. Then he tells a couple of parables. And one of those is, is uh, the parable of the talents, where um, it, it ends kind of on an ominous note, where those who did not want me to be king over them 
um, are, are punished. After Jesus said this, after he said this, Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus has been going up to Jerusalem ever since the turning point in the middle of the gospel where Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem. After Jesus said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he had come near to Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road, And as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. The first sign, though I I didn't know it at the time, was a dark cloud to the north. It was a wall cloud, a wall of black cloud that was making its way towards us. And, And when it hit us, it hit with wind and rain and enough hail that most of the roofs in town were damaged and needed replacing. And after the wind came through, it was still and quiet and cool. The humidity had gone. It was another sign, though I really didn't know it at the time. It got cool and still, but then all of a sudden it became humid again, and then the wind hit once again. There were signs, even though I didn't know it at the time, I hadn't really experienced the approach of tornado season in that way before, but but sometimes you can see a wall cloud coming when a tornado is about to hit. Sometimes you can feel a change in the weather. Sometimes you hear sounds like people describe like the sound of a mighty uh, a freight train coming. There are signs when a tornado comes near, and I'm mentioning that because, well, in this passage, we see, we hear, perhaps feel, that Jesus is coming near. So our theme for the season has been, Will You Come and Follow Me, taken from the song that we'll sing after the message. This week it's, Will You Let Your Love Be Shown? Will You Let My Name Be Known? And in the past number of weeks, we've read a number of passages where that word follow shows up, a word follow or come in behind and go after or, or even sometimes go ahead have appeared in most of the stories that we've read up until in, in the last number of weeks. And so, for example, we heard that after Jesus invited or called some disciples to follow him, he said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit. 
for the kingdom. Or, or we heard of the woman who stood behind, came in behind Jesus and poured a jar of expensive ointment on his feet, anointing him. Last week we heard how Zacchaeus ran ahead in order to climb a tree so that he might see Jesus. Or before that, that when that blind man was healed, he got up and he followed Jesus on the way, praising God. And so presumably that man is among these people who are coming to Jerusalem, approaching, drawing near to Jerusalem with Jesus on Palm Sunday. Those words, follow or come in at behind, appear in all of those stories, but none of those words are in today's story. Even though there's this great crowd that's with Jesus singing and shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But Luke tells us three different times that Jesus was coming near. He was coming near to the Mount of Olives, to Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives. He was coming near, our translation says, approaching, but the same words used. He was coming near to the place where, where the path went down from the Mount of Olives. And then as he came near and saw the city, and this is a picture, a modern picture, obviously. Uh, things would have changed dramatically since then, but it's a place where you can see that the city of Jerusalem is, you can, can be seen from the Mount of Olives. As Jesus came near and he saw the city, Jesus wept over it, saying, if you'd only known the things that make for peace. Jesus wept. Jesus wept while, while the crowds were shouting joyfully, praising joyfully with, with a loud voice. And that mix of emotions, actually, can be heard in the way, different ways that word, those words come near are used in the Gospels. A, a few weeks ago, I think, in, the, in connection with the story of the healing of the blind man outside of Jericho, I said that, the word, that Luke doesn't use, seem to use those words as much as some of the other Gospels do. That where Matthew and Mark tell us that when Jesus began his ministry, he said, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of heaven is near. Luke doesn't report it quite the same way. Luke, I think, accomplishes the same thing by telling us that Jesus went to the synagogue in Nazareth and unrolled the scroll of Isaiah and read there in the synagogue from Isaiah where it says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to let the blind see, to, the, you know, healing, to proclaim healing for the lepers. And then Jesus says, Today these words are fulfilled in your hearing. The day of salvation has come near in the presence of Jesus. The kingdom of God has come near. But, but, but Luke doesn't seem to use those words as much as some of the other Gospels. Perhaps because his audience, maybe they would have meant less to his audience maybe than Mark's audience or Matthew's audience. For them, maybe that the, the, the concept of or what the people in Jerusalem or in, in Palestine were expecting when, when they heard that the kingdom of God was coming near would have meant less to them than it did to Mark or Matthew's audience in, in the same way that maybe the palm branches didn't really mean as much. Maybe that's, that same reason has been suggested for the reason that, that palms are not mentioned in Luke's story. Did you notice that? Palm Sunday. This is the triumphal entry. When people took cut branches from, palm, from trees and they waved them and they laid them in the road and yet, did you notice that Luke doesn't mention them? It's been suggested that maybe for Luke's Gentile audience that the significance of those palms as a symbol of victory or, 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 or related to the Feast of Tabernacles just meant less for them or didn't mean as much uh, or communicate as much as, as spreading cloaks in the road in homage to an important person would have meant. And yet, though Luke doesn't use the words as much in his gospel, in this story he mentions three times that Jesus was coming near. 
He was coming near to that place called the Mount of Olives. He was coming near to the place where, where the path went down from the Mount of Olives. He was coming near to the city. And when he came near to the city, he wept over it. And so Luke does use those words in some significant places. I mentioned a few weeks back that, that Luke does use them in connection with when, when, the, when the 70 were sent out and they were told that whenever a town or a house received them, they were to say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Or, or that when they were shaking the dust off their feet of a house that they re refused to accept them, they were to say, nonetheless, the kingdom of God has come come near to you. The kingdom of God is coming near in the ministry of Jesus and in the ministry of Jesus, you know, the people that Jesus sends out, and yet it's not always received in the same way. There's that kind of mixture of joy and sorrow in that. Or it's seen a little later as Jesus is talking about the signs of what's about to happen. You know, as he weeps over the city, he talks about how they will be surrounded by armies looking forward to the destruction, looking ahead to the destruction of Jerusalem. And he says that there certain, will be certain signs, and when those signs come, he says to the people that it's a sign that your desolation is near. That word is used again. But then a little later in the same chapter, in the same speech, he says to his followers, stand up, because these are also signs that your redemption is drawing near. Your redemption is drawing near. See, both trouble, both salvation, and both trouble and salvation can come near. And that mix of emotions is found there in that word come near, but also found in another word that Jesus uses when he weeps over the city, when he says, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Visitation is maybe sounds like a bit of an old-fashioned word. It's a word that we don't use that often anymore. Perhaps even because it has some somewhat ominous overtones. See, the word visitation in some of the ways that it's used as a verb or as a noun, it, it also refers to the episkopos or the, the overseer. Someone who has oversight, someone whose visit means that it's kind of like an oversight visit. It's an inspection. They're looking into things. They're auditing things. And so things can go wrong in those kinds of inspections. It has that kind of ominous overtone when, when in Numbers it speaks of God visiting iniquity from one generation to the, third gener to the third and the fourth generation. But at the same time, it also can be used in another way. And so Luke will tell us that when, when Jesus has healed the son of a widow outside the town of Nain, the people respond by saying, a great prophet is among us. And God has looked favorably upon his people. That's the modern translation. It could say God has visited his people. Because the verb there, visited, is the one that Jesus uses when he says that the people did not recognize the time of their visitation. But how often do we? I mean, how often do we recognize those really important moments when they come? How often do we really recognize those moments when, you know, that will make all of the difference when, 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 when a doctor's office calls or, or when a child brings someone home for the first time? When a job is offered or, 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 or a door is closed, when, when someone leaves? When a child comes to you and says, I've got something to tell me, you don't really know me when we're asked to, 
to do something hard, to volunteer, to serve, to do something that kind of stretches us. How often do we really recognize the significance of those moments when, when we look back on it, we realize that the way we respond in those moments will determine our life from that time onward or the shape of our relationships from that moment on, simply how we respond in that very moment that we weren't expecting, that we weren't looking for. and We didn't really recognize until it's over. How often do we recognize those moments when, well, when the way we respond will show who we are, what we're made of, and what we're like, who we really are as a follower of Jesus? How often do we recognize those? And can we, can we learn to recognize these times of visitation. Well, Jesus was coming near to the place that's called the Mount of Olives. And this again is a, a modern picture and is really they're almost impossible to get any idea of what that might have looked like when Jesus was there because everything's been built over so much. There are ancient churches, some of them with acoustics that just set your hair on edge. They're so perfect. Hair on end. I guess hairs don't go on edges. And, and along with those ancient churches, the ruins of even more ancient churches, the foundations of even more ancient churches that have been built there to commemorate this site, this place where Jesus prayed. There are still gardens there, but there's nothing quite like what the garden would have been. But when Jesus was approaching or coming near to that place, that's when he sent two disciples ahead to get a donkey a donkey that had been tied and a donkey that had never been ridden. And if that just seems like a lot of detail, it's because these are signs. I mean, if the fact that, you know, that, that, that there was a donkey that was tied up, that had never been ridden, ridden that Jesus gives these instructions and then we're, we're told that Jesus tells them what to say, what they will be asked and what they will say, that they went there and they were asked what Jesus said and they said what Jesus told them to say and they found everything just the way Jesus said it would be and they did everything just what Jesus said. If all of that seems like a lot of detail to go into, it's in part because these are signs. See, the donkey was tied up, which reminds us, or, or close readers of the Scripture, that, or those who read the commentaries, that there was a prophecy in the book of, Jer uh, uh, of Genesis that Jacob gave to his, as Jacob was blessing his children, and he prophesied that a descendant of Judah, a royal descendant of Judah, would tie his donkey to a vine. Though, though there the image might be uh, of one who, who ties his donkey to a vine in order to enjoy as a royal personage the, the best of wine and milk and, and all of the good fruits of the land. And this, this is a king who has to borrow a donkey. But there's an overtone, there's a hint there. The donkey was tied. It was a donkey that had never been ridden, which if you pay attention to, to some of the, the, the uh, requirements for sacrifices and other things in, 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 in the law, suggests that this donkey then was fit for use, but it could be set apart for God's use because it had never been used for anything else. And so it was off so something that would be appropriate to God's chosen one, the one God was sending, God's king. It was a donkey that had never been tied, uh, uh, that was tied, that had never been ridden. And when the people, you know, uh, when, Jesus, when they brought it to Jesus, they, they started taking off their coats and, and putting them on the donkey for Jesus to sit and laying their coats in the robe, which is what, uh, in the road, which is what the followers of Jehu did when Jehu became king of Israel, even though he had come there to that kingship through a violent act of bloody insurrection, putting to death a violent king, a bloody king before him. There are hints here. There are suggestions that there is something going on here that echoes but is different from the past. That when Jesus came in on a donkey, he was fulfilling what Zechariah saw when he saw God visiting his people. 
and God coming near to his people. Rejoice, O Jerusalem, for your king comes humble and riding on a donkey. There were signs that God's king was visiting his people, signs that God himself was coming near to his people. But would that visit mean desolation or redemption? Would God come near like a tornado or like a sunny day? See, there are signs here. But the signs are not as obvious as what we would like them to be. See, in our age, I think we've come to expect that anything really significant and important will have a countdown attached to it. And so if you watch New Year's Eve shows, you'll see that all through the evening there's a kind of a a clock counting down in the corner of the screen. There's there's no ball here like like the ball on the mass that falls down in Times Square. We've come to expect that really significant moments will have something that obvious because even when we know it's coming, we tend to get distracted and miss it. There's not as obvious as the signs we've come to expect, but the signs are there and they have always been there. When when John the Baptist was born, Zechariah, his father, who had been mute after the angel visited him, his tongue was released and he praised God, saying, Blessed be the God of Israel, for he has visited looked favorably, our translation says, on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us. From the time of John's birth, people like Zechariah knew something was happening, that God was coming near through the one that John was the forerunner to. As I've already said, when Jesus healed that young man or raised the widow of Nain's son at Nain. The people said God has visited his people. And on Palm Sunday, the people praise God. They shout with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they have seen. What they're praising God is for everything that they've seen in Jesus, for the way that Jesus brought good news to the poor, the way you know, the dead were raised, the way walked, you know, lame walked, uh, blind people could see, deaf people could hear. And all of those things were signs that in Jesus, God's life was coming to people. That God was visiting his people with salvation, not maybe in the way that he'd expected. He wasn't coming as a king who would get rid of the Romans in violent, bloody revolution the way Jehu did, but he was coming as a humble king, one who would bring salvation through his own sacrifice. Coming as a God who would give himself up as a servant in order to bring life to us. As the song said, it's not with sword, you know, loud clashing or roll of stirring drums, but with deeds of love and mercy that the heavenly kingdom comes. And that's what the people were responding to. That's what they were praising God for when they praised God for the deeds of power they've seen. And they praise God as Jesus comes near to the path that goes down from the Mount of Olives. Again, a modern picture, not a very good one at that. It's the only one I could find that I'd taken of a path that's going down towards Jerusalem in the distance. It's the middle of the three. Jesus came near to the Mount of Olives. He came near to the path that went down from the Mount of Olives. He came near and he saw the city. But when Jesus came near to this path that led down, the people praised God, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And when they praised God, they echoed the heavenly host that it praised God when Jesus was born. So we're told that when Jesus was born, Luke says, the whole host of heaven appeared to the shepherds and praised God, saying, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among those on whom his favor rests. And now we're told that the whole host of disciples 
praise God saying, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And I don't understand really why the angels sang of peace on earth and the disciples sing of peace in heaven. I've read so many different theories on that, I can't really, you know, come to it, except to say that through Jesus, through his birth, through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, peace comes. There's peace on earth through Jesus. There's peace in heaven because of Jesus. And in all of this, God receives the glory. See, there were signs here that God was coming near. When Jesus came near to that place where the road went down to Jerusalem, and yet for all of those signs, the Pharisees, they asked Jesus to tell the crowd to be silent. They did not recognize the time of their visitation. But how often do we? How often do we recognize those truly important moments, the ones that will change the shape of our life and relationships ever after. I mean, can we learn to pay attention to them? Can we prepare for those times when God comes near to us in Jesus? Well, when the, Jesus was making his way, coming near to Jerusalem, the people responded by taking their cloaks off and laying them in the road in front of them. And maybe this is a little act of overinterpretation here. But maybe that suggests that for us to be ready to recognize the time of visitation so that we can respond in the ways that God wants us to, we have to take something off and put something down like they're doing climbing trees, even if he's trying to stay hidden. We have to put aside our egos and lay them down in order to be ready when Jesus comes near. Perhaps it suggests that like, well, like, that, um, like Zacchaeus who, who, who promised then that he would you know, give half of his possessions to the poor and, and if any did defrauded anyone to repay that four times that we have to be willing to give up something we value, something we have communicated or accumulated that we have to lay that down and do what we can to make things right. If we're going to be ready when Jesus comes near. Perhaps suggest that like that tax collector who is in the temple to pray. We have to humble ourselves. Say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. We have to lay down our pride in order to be ready when Jesus comes. Perhaps as Jesus taught the people when, you know, uh, uh, as, as, who, who were looking forward to the big, great feast in God's kingdom, and, and he said, when you go to a dinner, you know, don't choose the best seats. We have to lay down our eagerness to elbow others aside so that we're front, first in line in order to sit at a lower place waiting for God's recognition. Or, as Jesus would go on to say, that we have to invite to our dinners those who can't invite us back. In other words, perhaps part of what we're doing here as we're laying down our cloaks in the road in front of Jesus is putting aside our ego, our pride, our, our position to try to learn to live in the ways Jesus has taught us. That when we practice living in the ways that Jesus has taught, then in those really crucial, unlooked-for crisis moments, we're prepared. Maybe as we practice living in the ways Jesus taught, we learn to see, hear and see and feel him coming near, and we're able to respond then in ways that bring grace to others instead of judgment, that foster relationships instead of fracturing them, that show then what we're made of as followers of Jesus. Maybe, maybe that seems like a lot. It's hard to put your cloak down in the road 
where a donkey will trample on it. It's hard to let go of our ego. But maybe, maybe it helps to know that when we do that, we're not alone. The Pharisees asked Jesus to tell the crowds to be silent. And Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the very stones themselves will shout out. See, in the Psalms and the Scriptures and the prophets, whenever God comes near, there is a response. There can't help but be a response. And when God comes near, the sea roils, the Jordan rivers turn back, the mountains skip like lambs, the hills like rams, and the trees clap their hands, and the stones shout out in praises. So we'll not be alone if we respond to God's coming with, self, with, with praise, because creation itself will be praising The only question, there will be a response when God comes near. And the only question is whether we will join or whether we'll leave it to the stones. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts that we might see, we might hear, we might feel the signs that Jesus is coming near. And that we might respond with praise and service, and joy. In Jesus, amen. Let's stand to sing. And now, God, go before you to lead you. God, go behind you to protect you. God, go beneath you to support you. God, go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. May the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you. Do not be afraid. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.